I think I stand before you as a, as a renegade, really, because uh, I'm going to talk about Republicans. Sorry, Richard. And I'm also going to talk about high politics. Um, so I think I'm maybe a bit different in, in that way. And also, maybe I'm a bit of a reactionary because I'm not going to show any slides. Um, <laughs> so, sorry. Uh, but I am going to talk about uh, British maritime rescue efforts uh, in the Spanish Civil War. Um, which, in my view, is a rather under-researched um, topic. So, on the 26th of June, 1939, the London-based News Chronicle published the testimony of an eyewitness to the last days of the Republic in Alicante. Thousands of would-be refugees teamed on the dockside and scanned the horizon, hoping against hope to catch sight of government-fleeted ships which would ferry them into exile. The ships, as probably most people know, never arrived. And just to give you an idea of some of the responses to that, according to the, um, the eyewitness who was from the United States, around 50 people uh, committed suicide that night, uh, some of them hacking at their veins with pen knives. <coughs> now these deaths weren't entirely senseless, because a grim future stood in store for those left high and dry on the dock. CNT activist Jose Maria Arcor, for example, came to the who was at Alicante, came to the attention of the Francoist police, who beat him, subjected him to waterboarding, hauled him before a military tribunal, and condemned him to death. He then spent a year on death row before his sentence was commuted to 30 years, but not before he was dragged before what he thought was going to be his own execution. Now, what I want to suggest today is that the British government shares a degree of responsibility for the fate of people such as Arcoa. For its consular officials ordered the Royal Navy not to provide protection to the vessels that the Republicans and their supporters had sent to Alicante. The command from the consular official meant that the ship's captains did not dare run a blockade of Francoist warships lurking off Alicante. Today the consequences of the British action, actions are more apparent than ever as a result of the detailed research that's gone into the um, uncovering the sustained and I would say long misrepresentative, misrepresented Francoist post-war repression. To give you just one example of the scale of that post-war repression, in the ten years between 1939 and 1949 the estimates are that about 10,000 people uh, were murdered or killed after trial. Um, that's not to mention, as probably a lot of you know, the numbers of prisoners, um, people who had their properties taken away from them. A whole series of uh, acts of repression. So I think the literature uh, on exile appears a pace or two behind the literature on the repression. One reason for this, I think, is that uh, a lot of the exile literature has been quite concerned with the over 400,000 refugees who crossed over the land border between Spain and France uh, after the fall of Catalonia or Barcelona in uh, late January 1939. A lot of the exile literature also looks at the actual experience of being in exile, often in France or Mexico or some of the other countries where exiles uh, lived. Now one of my ideas is that I think historians have paid significantly less attention to attempted evacuations by sea. One exception is uh, the work by the Francoist diplomat Javier Rubio, um, but I think there are a number of problems with, with his work. Um, one of his arguments, I think, that comes through in, in his book, or his books, uh, is that the insurgents somehow behaved slightly more in, uh, humanely than the Republicans when it came to evacuation and refugee work. Also, Rubio rather rails against what he saw as a kind of liberal Anglo-American historians like Gabriel Jackson, who he thought were bent on ju unjust, uh, unjustifiably championing the re championing the Republic. Now there's a, there's a kind of seam, I think, of this 
uh, kind of interpretation, we can, we can see a, a, a different aspect of it in the work of Robert Stradling, who argues that pro-Republican historians have won the battle to define the past. One way they've done that, he says, is, is really by portraying Franquists as brutal slayers while soft-pedaling the crimes of supporters of the Republic. So this, this kind of difference coming out between uh, Republicans and, and Franquists in, in, that, in this sense. The, pos the position of um, supposedly pro-Republican historians has also come under the examination in, or come under an ex examination in the work of Tom Buchanan, who in a very interesting, very good article, has argued that the notion um, common in some circles that the British government discriminated against the Republican government fails to stand up to scrutiny uh, when we look at the humanitarian work of British consular officials. And his argument really is that these officials were inspired by the values of fair play and work quite hard to treat both sides equally. So what I would like to suggest today is that if we turn to study British maritime uh, evacuation work, we can think about this literature in, in other ways. One of the things I think we can do is start by placing this evacuation work in, in the, histor or the historiography of exile much more closely uh, in the context of the work that's been going on on Franquist repression. I often have the feeling when I read these two bodies of literature that they're not always talking to one another. Also, I want to suggest that by looking at these uh, maritime evacuation uh, works, the, the problem's not so much that people have over-romanticized the Republic, which maybe there is some, some truth in that on occasion, but there's been a tendency, I think, when looking at exile work and humanitarian work to underplay, this might sound strange to you, but I think it's the case, that underplay the brutality of the Franquists, particularly in their regard to humanitarian work. And I think one of the effects of that is maybe to compound um, a number of years of the denial of the repression, of the Frankist repression, or the misrepresentation of that repression. Now, crucially, I think, uh, if we look at these things, I think we have to acknowledge that British consular officials, at crucial moments, um, discriminated against uh, Republicans and behave much more favorably, I think, towards um, Franquists, despite the brutality uh, that characterized uh, the, brutality, the, the Franquist regime. Okay, so to, to kind of make my case, I'm going to start by talking about why I think the Republicans proved much more cooperative in uh, humanitarian work uh, in the Spanish Civil War. Um, the context for that, I suppose, is that in the government side territory, as I'm sure many of you know, about 50,000 people were murdered uh, in the government zone, many of them in the first few months uh, of the Civil War, and of course, infamously, large numbers of clergy and supporters of the church. So there were some terrible dangers that people faced. Um, So uh, what I'm going to look at is the way in which these uh, people were helped uh, by the Republican uh, regime. And by contrast, I'm going to look at the Franquists who received quite a lot of help from the British, even though they refused to help their own supporters uh, in many ways, and received um, help despite the fact that these the, the Franquists uh, murdered around 150,000 people in their own zone. Now one of my arguments is going to be it's not so much that the British were kind of so much favorable or against the Republic. One of the problems the British had was that they really were afraid of um, annoying the Franquists, worrying, um, outraging the Franquists by helping to evacuate uh, Republicans uh, from Spain. Uh, the crucial reason there, I think, is that um, Franco wanted to capture as many opponents as possible and he would be deeply annoyed with the British if he helped those 
people escape. So at crucial moments, this became quite important in British thinking. Okay, so I'm going to start by looking at uh, the record of the uh, Republican government. Now, consulting the Foreign Office records, it's very clear that the Republican government had proved far more cooperative uh, in British refugee work in Spain than the Franquists. The Foreign Office records demonstrate that as early as November 1936, the British government, with the cooperation or with the assistance of Republican officials, had helped to evacuate 11,095 right-wing refugees from government territory. They did this in 220 voyages, covering around uh, 75,724 miles and at a cost of £40,000. At the same time, it hadn't helped evacuate any refugees from government, the government side, right, except for a small exchange deal that was carried out with the cooperation of the Basque regional government uh, and with the help of the International Red Cross. Similarly, from June 1937, the Spanish government allowed the evacuation of women, children, and men under the age of 17 or over the age of 46 from Madrid. With the support of Republican officials, the British consulate in Madrid set up an evacuation office where people afraid to register with the government authorities could put themselves forward for evacuation. Through the summer and autumn of 1937, the British consul in Madrid worked with the Republican government to transport to Valencia 3,500 Francoist refugees holed up in foreign missions in the capital. From here, and despite the continued insurgent refusal to help with finance, they were evacuated on British chartered ships. Franco then left the British really to stump up the cash for this evacuation work. Um, and another example, in August and September 1937, while Republican refugees were left stranded in Santander, the Treasury, the British Treasury, authorised the spending of £15,000 on chartering a ship to transport Francoist refugees from the Madrid missions to France. The cost soon soared, and by the 25th of November, the British had expended £25,000. By contrast, the United Kingdom government defended its refusal to pay to help the evacuation of government supporters in places like Santander on the argument that the Spanish government had declined a United Kingdom offer to help bring about the interna international organization of relief on an impartial basis. And this referred to the British condition that both government supporters and their opponents were evacuated <coughs> in equal measure. Now, if one accepted the danger, sorry, if one accepts that the danger stemmed not from kind of frontline violence, from collateral damage, as I think it's called, but from violence behind the lines, then the rule made little sense, because Francoists were unlikely to murder their own supporters, and of course, most of the people being captured were falling to the Francoists. Another part of the explanation for British policy lies in the naive or perhaps disingenuous argument put forward by some British officials that Republican lives did not stand in danger from Francoists. One British Mandarin commenting on government supporters waiting for evacuation in, on the, in August 1937, for instance, noted, and this is the quote, at least no one is going to murder them. But the British government discriminated most of all against government supporters because this, the insurgents themselves consistently refused to allow any help with evacuating their own supporters. Tired of appealing to Franco, British diplomats had largely retreated to lick their, their wounds. One British Foreign Office official lamented in the autumn of 1937, for example, that, and this is the quote, it's inconceivable that General Franco will authorise a large-scale evacuation of women and children from Gijón. In October 1937, Eden had drawn the pessimistic conclusion that to ask Franco to help with evacuation, and again this is the quote, is merely to court refusal. 
The outstanding occasion on which the British did help the government, uh, government supporters served only to reinforce British re reservations about the merit of refugee work with Republicans. In the spring of 1937, the British gave protection to large numbers fleeing Bilbao. Following its declared policy, the cabinet tried to force its consul, Mr. Stevenson, to evacuate government supporters in equal numbers with Francoists from the city. Although Stevenson res resisted this policy to a degree, he did insist on the evacuation of Francoists who stood little danger from Franco's occupying forces. Despite this, the Francoists proved furious with the British for assisting with the mass evacuations and accused His Majesty's government of using humanitarian intervention to subvert the insurgent efforts to starve their opponents into defeat. It was seen as military intervention, in fact, uh, by the, by the Francoists. <coughs> Chastened by the Francoist fury, after the fall of Bilbao, the British would work hard not to offend a general whose favour they were working hard to curry. Indeed, in an effort to placate the insurgents, the Foreign Office went so far as to produce a memorandum in, the, in November 1937, which brought together a whole range of statistics to demonstrate that the British, over the course of the conflict, had, ev had evacuated far more rebel and insurgent sympathisers than backers of the government. Now, this determination of the British to assuage uh, Francoists or Franco led to frontline diplomats discriminating against Republicans. A clear example of this comes in uh, August 1937. The Basque Army, along with a sizable body of uh, Basque Nationalist Party leaders, PNB leaders, had retreated to Santonio, Santonia and Santander where they surrendered, first of all, to Italian forces before being handed over to uh, Franco's own men. Fearful that, they, uh, that its political leaders would uh, be executed, the PNV representatives in France struck a deal with the British. In return for the release of 18 Francoist prisoners still held by the Basques, who were holding them as hostages, basically, the Royal Navy would sail to Santander and rescue at least 150 Basque leaders. Consul Bates went aboard with an important PNV dignitary. When they arrived at Santander, however, Bates reneged on an agreement and insisted that he would only rescue 17 Basque leaders in proportion to the number of Francoists who had gained their freedom. Six of the PNV leaders left behind, and there's a very vivid description uh, of the people who were left behind on the shore, kind of begging to be taken on board this ship. Six of these leaders were later executed, and many more were saved only by the extremely active intervention of the Italians, who were recoiling at the time at the uh, bloody measures being taken by Franco. There's another example that comes from 31st of March 1939, when Consul Gordon, who was in Gandia, which is a British-run port at the time, who was concentrating on the evacuation of Casal, who had come to power through a coup, as I'm sure most of you know. Um, what, uh, sorry, what Gordon did was to scuffer, scupper efforts to rescue thousands of Republicans stranded in Alicante. Gordon's actions later caused a stink both in the Foreign Office and in government circles, so there's quite a lot of uh, information on this. Called to justify his actions, Gordon explains that he'd gone against British Admiral Tovey, who was the commanding uh, military figure in the area, who had wanted to send British ships to protect vessels sent by Republican organizations. He'd also come under pressure from a number of British humanitarian and French activists who were in the area. He did so uh, with an eye towards winning Franco's support and because another consul, a guy called Hilgarth, who was, um, some people say that he was connected to British intelligence, he was a very close friend of Churchill's and very close to the, or had very close associations with the Franco regime. He, he was based in Mallorca and he'd sent a communication to Gordon telling them that um, if he did assist with this evacuation at uh, Alicante, uh, the British would very seriously lose Franco's favour. So it was that message that was decisive for him, uh, according to records in the Foreign Office. 
Okay, so I think by recognizing this, we need to acknowledge the Consul Bates, Consul Hilgarth, and Consul Grodden didn't always act with a sense of fair play. Bearing this in mind, the issue seems not so much to be uh, presenting an over-romantic image of the Republic. Here I want to detract from the terrible murders that took place on the government side. Rather, what I want to do is recognize that the Franquists consistently blocked the evacuation of Republicans and even refused to help their own supporters. By doing so, they left the Republican and British governments to shoulder the burden of the costs of evacuation. We should, we should remember that once the Franquists laid their hands on government supporters, despite the claims of uh, British con uh, diplomatic officials, they treated their captives abysmally. By recovering this tale of frequently frustrated maritime evacuation efforts, well, you can also see that in many ways the Republic lost the writing of history which for so long underplayed the Franquist repression and has rarely acknowledged the contrasting nature of Republican and Franquist humanitarian work. In this sense, the myth of the transition period that we were all equally guilty appears singularly inappropriate um, in this regard, and by questioning it, we can both further ch challenge Franquist denial and begin to acknowledge an element of British responsibility in the Franquist repression. And that's it. Thank you very much.